on this episode of The Story Behind. I'll be changing my usual format to talk more about me and my plans of becoming rich and famous. Stop right there! Who are you? The real question is, who are you? I'm Emily, the host of... No, you're not. You're Erica, Emily's evil twin. How dare you? How did you know? Because when you kidnapped the real Emily, you didn't realize she was on the phone with me, Dr. Drake Ramore, and I heard everything. Well, I'll have to take care of you then. Not so fast. You wouldn't kill your own brother, would you? No, that's not possible. It is possible. When I came out of my coma and got over my amnesia, I vowed to track you down and take care of you once and for all. Drake, no. Put the gun down. Give me one good reason not to pull the trigger. Because I'm the only one who can host this particular podcast. I'm your host, Erica, Emily's evil twin, and this is the story behind soap operas. But first, a quick message. If you like this podcast, you might be interested in other podcasts that focus on the humanities. In fact, if you search Twitter for the hashtag Humanities Podcasts, you'll find plenty of shows on history, language, literature, philosophy, art, and more. These are podcasts by people who enjoy telling stories, exploring the arts in our world, and who want to share their knowledge. Some examples of the podcasts you'll find are Myth Take, focusing on Greek mythology, the Feast podcast, which talks about great meals and history, or the Lonely Palette, an art history podcast. Search hashtag Humanities Podcast today or follow Humanities Podcasters on Twitter. And if you're a Humanities Podcaster, use the hashtag in your tweets so others can find you. In the summer of 1930, Three Northwestern University students began performing a sketch series called Clara, Lou, and M. And when it was picked up by WGN in Chicago, the three actresses portrayed in the series weren't paid. But when the show became more popular, Colgate Palmolive took notice and offered to sponsor the show. Radio executives realized their target audience during the day were the stereotypical housewives, the demographic of those who did the household shopping and would care more about products offered by companies like Colgate Palmolive. Erna Phillips was an actress hired by WGN and was given the assignment to create a daily show about a family, with executives hoping to tie in products typical 1930s housewives would be interested in. By the fall of 1930, Phillips had written, directed, and starred in what is considered the first soap opera, Painted Dreams, which focused on a mother and unmarried daughter. And with that, the first soap opera was born. The name soap opera, coming from the majority of products advertised within the show, an opera as a tongue-in-cheek allusion to the higher form of entertainment, basically mocking the genre. But it was the serial nature of soap operas that kept listeners hooked to these 15-minute radio shows day after day. Phillips was also the creator of The Guiding Light, which transitioned to television in 1952. Before television soap operas, it was easy for housewives to do their cleaning and chores while listening to the radio. But when soap operas moved to television, the unfortunate stereotype of the bonbon-eating, soap opera-obsessed wife on the couch emerged. But this didn't occur overnight, as many in the radio soap opera business were slow to come around to television, especially because of the dramatic cost increase. Radio soap operas didn't need the equipment, sets, props, makeup, or costumes of a television series. Actors not only had to read their lines with conviction, they had to memorize them or convincingly read them from cue cards, not to mention they had to act out the dialogue. The First Hundred Years was the first television soap in 1950, and it was produced and sponsored by Procter & Gamble. When the big advertisers dropped the smaller radio stations in favor of television, radio soap operas began dwindling and executives found they could make a better profit with spot ads in between DJs playing music.
When radio soap operas made the move to the small screen, many of the familiar elements also transitioned, such as an unseen announcer in the beginning, the dramatic organ theme music, transition music, and Friday cliffhangers. At first, the shows continued to be 15 minutes long, but it was Erna Phillips' new show, As the World Turns, in 1956, that became the first to stretch out the show to 30 minutes. The pace was slowed down and multiple cameras were utilized to feature reactionary shots. Following the success of As the World Turns, when new soap operas were introduced, they were at least 30 minutes long. By the 1970s, daytime dramas were earning profits that far surpassed primetime television, especially considering the low production costs. Network executives noticed and used the soap opera model as a springboard to creating primetime dramas, like Dallas in 1978. But it wasn't until the season finale cliffhanger of Who Shot JR in 1980 that producers transformed it into a full-fledged serial drama. By the way, if you're unfamiliar with Dallas and the Who Shot JR plotline, you might remember The Simpsons spoofing it with the Who Shot Mr. Burns plotline at the end of season 6. Following the success of Dallas, more primetime serials came on the scene, like Dynasty and Falcon Crest, and a spin-off called Knott's Landing. In the mid-1990s, soap operas began losing viewers. More women were leaving the homemaking world and entering the workforce, but that was only part of the reason soap opera viewership dropped. Another reason became the increasing popularity of talk shows. The budgets for these talk shows were even less than those of soap operas. The soap opera style of television still has a place today. Just look at Downton Abbey and Game of Thrones, even. But the daytime serial dramas most notable for holding the title of soap opera have had a downward trend this decade, including the cancellation of many daytime staples, such as Guiding Light and One Life to Live. Ever notice that a soap opera looks a bit different from other television shows? Well, remember when I said the cost of making a daytime soap opera was less than that of a primetime show? That's because time is not on the side of soap operas, having to put out a new episode every weekday. In order to minimize the number of takes needed for different camera shots, the actors are generally lit from all angles, whereas weekly shows have the luxury of being able to reset the lights after every take and put the camera at different angles. On top of that, soap opera sets are usually smaller in scale, compared to regular network shows, requiring more backlighting, which gives the effect of the actor popping out against the background. Another thing you may notice in soap operas is what's called rapid aging syndrome. In the 1990s, Days of Our Lives got a boost of young viewers when they introduced a teenage set of characters. But as that season progressed, the characters aged at an unreal rate, and one character, Samantha Brady, played by Allison Sweeney, went from being born in 1984 to being born in 1977. Now, if you've seen a soap opera, you'll know sometimes it takes weeks to get through a single day. But if you're a child on a soap opera, you may take a vacation or go to boarding school, only to come back as a teenager in the next season. Conversely, if you're an adult in a soap opera, you may stay in your 30s for more than 10 years as seasons progress. Don't think too hard about it, though. If you're stuck in a soap opera, you probably have bigger problems to worry about, such as becoming pregnant every time there's intercourse, weddings being broken up, funerals being crashed, disappearances, reappearances, murder, people coming back from the dead, comas, amnesia, adultery, and, of course, no one ever being able to keep a secret. Thanks to Craig from the Ultra Podcast for playing Dr. Drake Ramore on this episode. And we hope you got the friend's reference with his character's name. Information for this episode was sourced from museum.tv, Old Time Radio Catalog, Mental Floss, the book Historical Dictionary of American Radio Soap Operas by Jim Cox, and more links which can be found in the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. Follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Story Behind Pod, or subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks for listening.